So I want to take you back. I want to take everyone back to about the mid late nineties, because that's when Palm and I really kind of, we started working together. We bumped into each other. It's a long story about how that, how that happened, but we, we really shared this joint obsession with Sikh heritage in all of its forms. We were kind of, we were young, we were fresh out of university. Um, I mean, literally all of its forms. And we were hoovering up in the mid nineties, almost anything that we could find uh, related to Sikh heritage, whatever that meant, material heritage, at places like Portobello Road, where you'd find us most Saturdays when it was actually an antiques market and not just a place selling churros and tourist rubbish. Um, but you'd find us in um, uh, auction houses up and down the country, but also lots of archives as well. And I think that's what, that was something that, it wasn't about acquisition back then. It was about acquisition of knowledge and information uh, and some objects, but at some point you realize your pockets aren't that deep. Um, and we found ourselves in archives, not just, not just written archives, but also the archives of places like the Victoria and Albert Museum, which, which is the repository of so much of our material heritage. And I've got to say, Palm, I think it was pretty indiscriminate what we were doing then. We were just collecting anything and everything that we could, we could find. There was a whole stack of stuff related to the Golden Temple, for example, that we became so dulled towards that we didn't realise this fantastic cache of information that was there and that ultimately became of course the book uh, the golden temple of amritsar reflections of the past um, but we were extraordinarily i think productive i look back on those days 20 something years ago and i can't believe the amount of stuff that we did in archives in india archives in the uk um, even an early website we were on netscape navigate we were one of the first sick websites out there. This is a later version, Palmjit, from, from when we were publicizing the book, but before that, it was a collection of images. We produced a, a traveling exhibition at one point, which you could pop into the back of your car, and that was borrowed by Sikh University, sorry, Sikh Universities, University Sikh Associations and Gurdwaras up and down, up and down uh, the country. And it was, I mean, I look back on it now, and I was looking at some of the information from it, and um, it didn't really have like a common thread to it other than it was all things sick, uh, if I remember correctly. But what synthesized all of that, what brought it all together was really the Arts of the Sick Kingdoms exhibition, which in the late 90s, so the Arts of the Sick Kingdoms exhibition was a, an exhibition put on at the Victoria and Albert Museum in 1999. I think it opened in April, ran till about October. Um, but in the two years preceding that, obviously they were doing the research for it, and we were lucky enough to get involved in that, look at the archive, work with Susan Strong in particular, and other, other curators as well, um, just to help fill in gaps and, and you know, complete some of the things that they didn't really have too much contextual knowledge of. And that picture up in the top right-hand corner, which I'm sure Palm will make you smile, um, is us in, India, and I think it was just outside Chandigarh, wasn't it? Or yeah. Just yeah, yeah, that's right. Like road, isn't it, from Chandigarh? Yeah. 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 For some, I don't know how, but we knew that there was this encampment of Nahangs there, and we filmed this chap here on the right, on the far right. I don't know if you can see him standing next to me. We no, no, I mean, in the centre, with the kid in front of him, Mulgit Singh, I think his name was. We filmed him. He was the Jathadar of that Gurdwara. Okay. I've, got, I've got both of them actually. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. You're absolutely right. The one in the middle, I've, I was going to, I was going to mention because there was a reason. Oh, we filmed them, right? So we filmed them tying their Nihang the stars, these towering, tall uh, the star bungas. And the reason we did that is because a few weeks earlier we were in the conservation department of the Victoria and Albert Museum, and they were conserving their the star bunga which is, if you've been to the V&A, it's on permanent display now, I think, which is this kind of conical blue turban. And on that conical turban are these beautifully damascened and um, uh, gilded chukkas and braided wires. And it's just a beautiful object, but it's obviously in a gallin hung piece. And when they were conserving it, they asked us this question, which was, 
this, does this thing have a chin strap? You know, like a motorcycle helmet might have a chin strap. Does it have a chin strap? Because what they saw underneath all these chakras was this cane substructure, this conical substructure, which was obviously used to, to display those weapons. Um, and they thought perhaps the Nahangs picked it up in the morning, popped it on their head, stuck a chin strap underneath it, uh, and off they went into battle. Uh, so it was really wonderful to be able to go to these guys, get them to film them, showing them tying their hair, showing them tying even more weapons into their hair uh, as they did it. So that was the kind of thing that we were doing with the VNA back in 97, 98, whenever it was. And it was the, the principles behind the Victorian Albert Museum, uh, Debbie Swallow, uh, behind the exhibition, sorry, Debbie Swallow and Susan Strong, who encouraged us to really take our very eclectic collection of images, which we kept in these binders, um, and turn it into a book. Um, and to cut a long story short, that was, that was the book, Warrior Saints. And if there was a common theme running through our rather sort of random collection of stuff, it was the story of the Sikh martial tradition. And that's what Warrior Saints does. It tells a story over 300 years. Um, it's actually 400 years, but we started the story with uh, Guru Har Gobind uh, and took it right the way through to today. Now, 1999 coincided with the 300th anniversary of the Khalsa, which is why there was a lot of attention um, in the Sikh world. So we were able to tell this story and really kind of satisfy a need. And I think publishers were interested at that moment in time. Interestingly, I.B. Taurus, who published it, never published another Sikh book of this nature. Uh, again, they've done, they've done some other things that have kind of touched on the Sikh world, but never gone back to it. Now, accompanying the, the text, which um, I reread over the weekend, and actually it's reasonably good, it's not that bad, it's kind of stood the test of time. But the more important bit were the hundreds, hundred plus images um, of paintings, photographs, that were largely previously unpublished. And I think that's what really made uh, that book stand out. Accompanying them were some very rich captions, something that the publishing world really doesn't like. Um, and then lots of original quotations as well. And what I'll do now is I'll just kind of pick out three or four of, uh, uh, three or four of those which I found um, particularly arresting. So this is, this is one of them. Um, it's um, it kind of really is one of those one that's become an image that's become phenomenally iconic now. Uh, and it's a, an Agali uh, photographed in Hyderabad in the 1860s by a photographer called Weston. And I think this is part of a, a series of images which show the, the headdresses of India. And the other images are pretty striking as well. You know, Weston was, if nothing else, a phenomenal artist in that he knew exactly kind of how to frame those compositions for, for maximum effect. And this is one of the, one, we had three criteria when we selected images for Warrior Saints. Um, one of them was that it should be artistically, you know, the, the stand, artistic standards should be very high, compositionally very, very high quality like this particular one. The second one is that it should be historically uh, important. And we've got some images which are historically important. And the third one is that they should just inspire people, inspire people to learn more about their heritage or history or, or tell them a story that they don't previously know. This one is definitely one of those ones that is uh, probably hitting two of those uh, things. Now the most striking thing about this image of course is the gajga, the central um, adornment made up of crescents and double-edged sword and it's fastened by this kind of braided wire and the chakras. This is the kind of thing that we were working on with the Victoria and Albert Museum during their conservation work. Um, now, Palm, you might want to comment on this. It's obviously a very questionable practicality. I don't think it has mm. anything other than kind of a visual appeal, but it is phenomenally striking, of course. Yeah, yeah this, re this relates to the time period when, when Sikhs had lost their empire and the only place where they were almost allowed to strut about in their pure original defiance or sense of identity was down in the south in Hyderabad, where they were employed mainly as bodyguards to the Nizam of Hyderabad, who had a, a Khatri Sikh Dewan or, or chief minister, finance minister. Um, and obviously, of course, there was also the, the last resting place of Guru Gorman Singh in the state of Hyderabad there on the banks of the Godavari River. So that colony of Sikhs was basically the, almost like the last bastion of 
that original fierce free free roaming tiger spirit if you like um and you know you couldn't imagine this chap doing a matate very easily and getting up without having a bit of trouble um but they had a whole tradition around the gadiga and the symbology in it is incredibly evocative of mythological indic tradition um so there's a lot woven into that and it's not just relevant to hindu civilization or sort of motifs but also to the islamic world with with the shia traditions um uh, bandadani and that sort of uh, um, tradition so yeah it's uh, it's remarkable and and you know that's there there's there's like you said there's a group of these photographs that were done for head you know to illustrate the headdresses of that part of india but there's three or four really brilliant photographs of nihangs that relate to this um, and there's probably hopefully there may be still more to be discovered you know that's the key i'm confident that there will be and i think you're going to be touching on one of them as well but th this picture for example for, for me palm is one of those ones that's become iconic you know it was never published beforehand i don't think there's a published source for that at all and yet it's gone on to inspire all kinds of things like mo much more modern artworks i found this on a, a mm. modern artist's uh web page um so that's a not that's a non Sikh artist. That's a, I think it's an American chap. I think. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and body art as well. And if you can't figure that out, that's I'm pointing to a very hairy armpit back there, and that's a an upper arm that he's, he's put it. That could well be my arm, Emin. Warrior Saints. Warrior Saints. I think brought much of this kind of imagery um, to the Sikh world. Now the other category that I mentioned were images that were historically important, so artistically not very very high quality. These are two particularly of poor quality in many respects images that are phenomenally important uh, images because they are the earliest photographs of six only in fact they're the earliest photographs of indians um, known photographed by a man called dr john mccosh a surgeon in the british indian army and if you think about photography you know wet chemical photography uh, in the very early days it was a uh, an act of science as, as much as it was an act of art um, so it was generally kind of si people with a scientific bent that were doing it and here we had a surgeon in the Indian Army who was um, who had taken what was you know, the first camera to India and this is in the year of 1848-1849 a very important year for the Sikhs of course because this is the this is just at the moment when the last sovereign Sikh state of Lahore uh, falls to the British uh, and the the page that we had, the photographs that we, we used two in the original book, um, where one of them here is, is just titled Sikh Sardar, so you just get a chance to see the kinds of men that would have fought on the Sikh side. Mukosh photographed not just courtiers and nobles from the Sikh court, but also prisoners uh, from, from the fighting as well. A photograph that we didn't include, but one that is just extraordinarily important, of course, is the boy king, Dalip Singh, photographed here um, in the year that he lost his, his kingdom. So this is like the first photograph of Maharaja Dalip Singh as a Maharaja, um, and the last photograph of him as a Maharaja, um, and obviously the earliest as well. Now, interestingly, in that album, and um, Pamji, I was going to talk to you about this over the weekend. There is a blank which says Maharani Jindangar. Sadly, sadly. I don't know what happened, Amon, but our memories have failed us because I went back with Jas um, Jasdeep Singh at NAM, National Army Museum, to look for that very same page, that folio, and <laughs> there's nothing. Unless somebody's uh, sniped it, it didn't, doesn't exist, and uh, our memories are playing tricks on us. Yeah, I mean, we... It's, our memory must have been fresh at the time because we've even noted it in the caption. Well, uh, well, that, there you go. I didn't, I didn't remember that, but I, I went back specifically with, on the mission to find that that folio, and it wasn't there. It's, it's, and uh, yeah, what can we say? We haven't. We, we looked at this a long time ago, and it had been put away and boxed. And I'm not saying anything's happened to that folio. It's just one of those things that we're going to find difficult to reconcile with the reality of what's there. We, we breathed too much. Um dust, paper dust, um, archival dust, right? Let's, let me keep moving on. This image here of the ruins of the Fort of Saragari, um, photographed after 1897, after the actual event itself, I think fits into all of the categories that we mentioned artistically, I mean, just compositionally wonderful, uh, historically very important 
and just an inspirational story. And since 99, when we published Warrior Saints, um, now, of course, there are multiple books and brilliant scholarship on what took place at Sardegiri, as well as some more questionable films and help as well else about it. But Sardegiri has now entered our um, sort of vocabulary as the kind of um, story of bravery, of courage. Uh, and if you don't know what it is, it's the story of 21, a detachment of 21 Sikhs from the 36th um, Sikh, Sikh Regiment who are in an outpost on the Northwest frontier and are attacked with no means of, of getting reinforcements by thousands of Afghani tribesmen. And rather than surrender, they fight right the way to the end. And all the while they are signaling out uh, what is going on. It's a phenomenally touching story. And I remember, I remember writing this in the book um, and there was almost nothing available apart from regimental histories. There, was this there were these photographs, there's a series about three or four of these. Um, and then there was things in regimental histories which are very difficult to pick apart. And I think there was one article in, in the Sikh Review uh, from the 1980s that, that I managed to find. Remember, this is pre-internet when things were scanned in. And it was from that. And that was the article that repeats the myth of the, of the UNESCO, um, that it was cited by uh, UNESCO. Um, but definitely one of my fa absolute favorite images in there. Here's a, um, another, another character that we brought forth in the book, Alexander Gardner, reasonably well known in fairness, um, photograph there on the left hand side, actually featured in the Arts of the Sixth Kingdoms exhibition. That, that photograph that we featured also in the book of Alexander Gardner with Dogra troops, um, which was, I think, photographed in Kashmir toward the end of his life was not well known. In fact, it wasn't, hadn't been seen before. I think we found it in Cambridge, an archive there. Um, and if you don't know Alexander Gardner, he's just this phenomenally intriguing character, Scottish American, uh, leaves America under some kind of questionable circumstances, spends 13 years in Central Asia as a soldier of, a soldier of fortune, um, and then 13 years in the uh, Lahore Darbar as a um, colonel of artillery for Ranjit Singh and he, he, is, he bears witness to some of the most interesting times in the Lahore court, not least of which the death of Ranjit Singh and then all of the kind of mass murder that took place after that and throughout all of that he's taking notes and he's a very reliable witness when he's, he then spends the latter part of his life in Kashmir because he tells his story, people document it um, and there are, there's a sort of a biography of sorts that's written about him. So he's this phenomenally intriguing uh, character. But even when we wrote that book in 1999, I think, Palm, you, you used John Kay's book, When Men and Mountains Meet, which has got this wonderful chapter about um, Alexander Gardner in it. And John Kay is like this god, isn't he? he was, he's like the, now we think of Dalrymple as the man that writes on India, but Dal, Dalrymple's guru, if you like, was, was John Kay and has written dozens of books about, not just about India, but specifically about travellers uh, in India as well. So it really is in the crosshairs of men like Alexander Gardner. And we found ourselves kind of repeating that we, what was known about Gardner in the 90s was that he was a bit of a charlatan, told a few top, tall stories, not terribly reliable witness. Um, and then what you've got there on the right hand side is the extraordinary privilege that we've had that Palmjit and his team have been able to do, which is to commission John Kay himself to write the biography of um, Alexander Gardner based on a lot of the research that you, you and your team subsequently did in unearthing lots of, uh, lots of Alexander's own writings himself, stuff that had not been previously known. So the Tartan Turban um, is kind of like a continuation of this, this thing that we started in, in 1999, I think. Just one other aspect before I hand over to, actually two things before I hand over to Palm. Warrior Saints is not just a book of photographs, it's a search for the authentic, it's a search for the original in, in Sikh history. You, you don't see us representing either in this book or any of our work that we've done, um, some of the more fanciful kind of polished uh, depictions of, of the Sikh world. Um, so for the World War One, of course, we had these, these images, again, these um, glass plate negatives, which weren't known at all 
uh, until that book came out that we were able to publish here. We have Men of the 15th, Moderna 6, in a barn in Flanders, uh, performing Keith then. But accompanying them, accompanying these beautiful photographs, we also had um, contemporaneous quotes as well, which we've carried on to the, to the new edition as well. And our work seemed to coincide with David Amisi, who just at that moment in time was unearthing these, these letters uh, that we all know so well now that were letters from the Indians that were captured by the censor, well, stopped by the censor, they were translated um, uh, in order to kind of get a sense of what was going through the minds of, of soldiers. So we were able to accompany these images with these wonderful elements as well, as you can see there. Um, I'm not going to rest too much on this one. This is an image that's kind of burnt into our minds as iconic now, of course. Uh, again, would not was just literally unpublished until we find it. What I found curious about this is that nobody has gone back to find all of the other images from that that series. We know them really well. I think we, I think we, um, we published a couple of them. I think we published a couple one and so on. The tug of war, the tug of war one we we published. But there's a series of about twenty images from this very day. So the day that the forty fifth six they go out to a divan in the desert. Um, they, there's pictures of them doing the divan, there's pictures of them doing tug of war, there's a few other images as well. And then there's photographs of them coming back as well, which actually we used in the exhibition, the Empire Faith War exhibition as well. Um, let me not dwell on that because I want to hand it over to you. F final image, which is a segue to you, Palmjit. Uh, this, this is kind of what the image of Hari Singh Nalwa looks like in our, in our 1999 book. So this is from a, um, a folio of images of biographies, about 50, I think it's 52 characters from, have I got that right? So it's in the 50s, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Characters from Ranjit Singh's court. So his courtiers, obviously his family members, some of his wives as well. So there's a beautiful portrait of each one. And then accompanying that is a biography that's written that actually, you're as well read as Palm is, you know where he bought them from. So a lot of it's kind of drawn from secondary sources, but the images are particularly um, particularly striking. This is of Hari Singh Nalwa. I, I remember this at the time was something we were really keen on doing because it kind of defies the popular modern image of, of him because not only is he wearing armor, but he's wearing a helmet. And of course, you know, that, that in the sick world, that can be almost quite controversial to the extent that Palm, you were telling me earlier on that when this image was published in a sort of a self publication sometime in the 80s, I think, that they did not caption this, that the writers there did not caption this as Hari Singh Nalwa because they could not believe that a Sikh general would wear a helmet. And so, they, what did they caption him as? Is it a... But they say, but they can't, Tawana. Okay, they, they... <laughs> they, swap, they swap the images over because he looked more like a Sikh Sardar. He looked more like Hari Singh Nalwa should look like. So, um, yeah, we don't get into that kind of revisionist stuff if that hasn't, uh, if that, if that hasn't um, become clear. But I want to show you what the original colour image looks like. So this is the original painting from, uh, from that book. And what Warrior Saints, the, the re-edition allowed us to do was to republish some of these, some of these images in colour, which we weren't able to do in the first uh, edition of the work. Uh, and I think that's one, not the only, but that's one of the real, the real beautiful aspects of so with that, Palm, um, can I hand over to you? You can indeed, sir. Thank you for that. It's a wonderful whiz through the past. That's what we're here to do. Um, okay, so um, as Emma touched upon, he looked at the original first edition and we decided after about 15 years, it was time to, to do a revamp, revisit on, on the story of Warrior Saints. So, you know, as Kashi House, its uh, third publication, I think it was, we decided to reissue a second edition, new and improved. Uh, you know, the, the, the interesting thing was from 99, we didn't stop researching. So we rolled in a lot more material and information and historical uh, analysis into this edition, which this is the first volume. And we're going to, I know we're going to get asked, but I think we already have been asked questions by uh, 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 the attendees, our audience about volume two, and we'll come on to that. Please bear with me. <laughs> so, Amin, if you could flick to the next slide. Um, 
So I'm, I'm talk, calling this bit, Hedging the Orchard with Thorny Trees. This is the quote that opens this new edition of Warrior Saints. And I'm gonna come back to this quote later. It's actually a brilliant metaphor that explains the origins of the Sikh warrior saint ethos that emerged in the face of persecution. So if you can go to the next slide, please, Alan. Okay, no, not a warrior saint <laughs> in the making, but this is me and my mum. I was a chubby little kid, rather uh, well-fed. Um, I just want to show you this to sort of put into your minds, give you a little bit of background about me um, in terms of how I, you know, got into this historical world and, and you know, just falling in love with it to the extent that it's become, you know, more than just a passion. My mum told me many years ago, this is years after we'd, I've done you know all sorts of books and exhibitions at them. she kind of just offhandedly said oh you know when i was pregnant with you and this is back in the 70s early 70s when i was pregnant i read a few books on sikh history that are in the house right so something must have kind of you know the, the circuitry must have been formed you know at that time you know the seed was planted but funnily enough it lay dormant for many many years um i was a you know I had my Sikh appearance growing up, but I knew nothing about Sikh tradition, Sikh life, you know, Punjabi, um, you know, language. I was a, I was a real, I don't gonna say, I'm not going to say the C word, but, you know, I was a, an empty shell, if you like. Um, and so completely disconnected. I've never been to India. I, the first time I went to India was when I was 24 years old. And so much of my formative years, I was completely detached from this wonderful tradition. Um, and it's only in my late teens that I started to get interested in. Some of that was to do with being embarrassed and being shamed into interest because at school, I remember one RE lesson, religious education, the teacher said, okay, today we're going to do the Sikhs and it's, you know, 1699. And there's a few Sikhs in the class. Um, and the teacher looked at me and said, okay, Palmjit, can you tell us what happened in 1699? You're a Sikh, you must know. And I hadn't a clue. And so it was a very embarrassing moment where I kind of had to face up to the fact that I, I, I was, you know, this, this, uh, I looked the part, but I didn't, you know, didn't, didn't have the, uh, I didn't, didn't have the, the stuff to back it up. But that pushed me and inspired me to, or pricked me enough to sort of say, well, you know, I've got to ask myself a big question. One was, if I'm a Sikh of Guru Nanak, then what's his teachings? And then that, that kind of takes you onto a path of trying to understand the philosophy. The other side was, you know, do the original traditions of the 10th Sikh Guru, you know, the final human incarnation of the 10 Gurus, do his traditions still exist? And that's why I asked myself when I was about 18 or 19 years old. Right? And, and it kind of led to an interesting sort of uh, search because there's two subparts to that question. If it's a yes, they do exist, then you want to know where they are and who's preserved them. And have they been diluted over time or have we been passed them down in a pristine form? If the answer to the question of do they exist, the answer is no, then the question that follows is why not? You know, what, uh, what happened and what are the ramifications for Sikhs around the world? So I kind of laid these questions in front of me and I have, right, right, I'm going to get answers to these as best of my ability. I'm going to kind of, you know, do what I can, meet the right people, you know, read the right books, ask the right questions to take this pursuit, you know, bull by the horns and try and find the answers. Um, and, you know, I was fortunate that I joined hands with people like Amun and others to sort of take that discovery through to its natural conclusion. Well, up to now, there's much more to discover. Uh, Amun, if you could switch to the next slide, please. Um, the, the, um, that took us to Warrior Saints, uh, you know, the, that, that initial search for the answers to those questions. And the, that's the first edition. The second edition, we, we kind of looked at the, the whole question of what, what is this book about? After, you know, 15 years of additional work, we decided to sort of revamp the whole story. And if I mean, you can go to the next slide, you know, we can do a bit of a spot the difference. Have a look at these two photographs. The, this, this double portrait encapsulates the complete story of Warrior Saints as a two-volume piece. Um, Ammon earlier on touched upon the subtitle, which was Three Centuries of Sikh Military Tradition. 
and we change that because of what this you know these two pictures represent to four centuries of Sikh military history because there was a break in the tradition and we also went back to an earlier time to Guru Hargobind in the early 1600s all the way through to 1999 covering a four century period um, and we wanted to really encapsulate more of the you know the, the complete story as we saw it and to express that break in the middle there was something cataclysmic that happened to the Sikh early Sikh tradition that subverted it and took it off into another direction completely and so okay so let's look at these two wonderful portraits these two veterans who we think are likely to be contemporaries of Maharaja Ranjit Singh right so these guys have seen or lived through the 1800s the rise and fall of the Sikh empire um, the picture on the left is of an Agali Nahang it's taken around the 1860s um, and you, you look at that and you think well to my mind that conjures up you know a wild untamed uh, person and you know there's an almost otherworldly quality or feel about that person that gentleman there you look on the right hand side though it's a subedad in the, the British Indian Army his name is Nihal Singh and he looks incredibly regal and majestic right but if you look at the you know underneath everything they could have you know it could have been the same person but they've gone on two different routes and if I was doing this talk live with an audience, I'd ask right now for a show of hands as to, you know, which one of these two would you prefer your ancestor to be, right? Do you want the wild, untamed, original, real deal, or the, the one that became, you know, this, this, this incredibly important character in British military history that connects and, you know, creates the shared history with uh, uh, Britain, uh, world wars, and so on and so, so, on and so forth. Um, so, like I said, we split. We decided to split the two volumes. The one, the volume one, deals with that image on the left. Volume two will will carry forward the story after that. You know, the original Sikh tradition has been been subverted with what happened to the Sikhs under the British Raj and later on under the Indian Raj. The 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 image on the left is is a brilliant way of looking at the early tradition, that whole story of how a, a tormented people rose to take action against persecution. And they created an empire and brought about an era of unprecedented peace and prosperity um, through their military tradition. But then they also suffered the fall of an empire and the British occupation of what was their homeland. And they were effectively this, uh, you know, when, when Britain came to take over Punjab and, and the Sikh Empire, they effectively dismantled that whole traditional uh, warrior culture. They defanged the snake, and that was the phrase that you see coming up in, in early texts about that time. Uh, let me just have a quick look. Uh, what's interesting is if you compare the a few features like the headdress, you know, the turban ornaments, you can see on the left that he's got this gajiga, which and it's, a, it's a really funny, wonky style turban. He may not have much hair, this, this elderly gentleman. Um, but if you see, there's a crescent with a central rod going up at an angle, and it's surmounted by a double-edged sword, and there's a couple of crescents, and it's put in, kept in place with two coits. Yeah, that's the gajiga, the, the, the elephant ornament, you know, the thing that marks out warriors who are, you know, powerful, mythic quality of, you know, able to take down elephants um, as in the Hindu legends. And if you look on the right, it's a very similar sort of emblem, but it's been changed and it's been repurposed to suit the needs of the British Empire. It gives them a sense of, well, you've got a military tradition, but now you're beaten, you're gonna work for us and we'll allow you to retain some of that tradition uh, in your lives as part of, but within the British military context, similar to how the Highlanders were barred from having, you know, um, they're only allowed to keep their military traditions alive within the encampment, within the British purview of their military culture. Um, and so really, in one sense, the chap on the left represents what, what we would say is the warrior saint, which is the independent, free-roaming tiger mentality. And the chap on the left is the saint soldier, who is dependent and without wanting to denigrate people who fought in, in, you know, under the British flag, the, the traditionalists see them as fierce lapdogs. They're ferocious and they're dangerous, but they're 
very much on a leash. They're working for another empire, another culture. Um, now, I mean, if we can go to the next slide, I just want to share with everyone some of my favorite images from uh, this volume one of Warrior Saints. Now, this equation sums up the Warrior Saints project. It's like ordinary people, but there's something extra added in to the mix, which were from, you know, from the historic. When you do the research, it's, it's clear that the traditions of Guru Gobind and the Tensi Guru, the spirituality, the literature, the warriorship, the kingship that he imbued within the Sikhs made them extraordinary. And through that, you've got the rise of the Singh Khalsa or these warrior saints. And they, they've taken basically a sublime philosophical message and established an empire uh, to ensure its survival. Um, and if you can go on to the next slide, please. So where does the story begin? Well, we begin with this wonderful painting in the glare style of Guru Nanak. Um, you know, we know he was born near Lahore in 1469. It's an age where, you know, Muslim and Hindu civilizations were at loggerheads. So, uh, in, you know, lots of an antagonism between the two civilizations. And Guru Nanak had a simple revolutionary message to unite people. And, you know, there is no Hindu, there is no Muslim, Muslim or Muslim. I.e. these labels have no value. Uh, and it's what you do that counts, right? It's not your actions that, that have higher merit. Um, by extension, he focused on the need to, um, on the needs of people to connect to, you know, the, 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 if you like, the soul, the undying element of the, the, their personalities, their, their humanity, with its ultimate source. That was, that's the key. And that's the key for a lot of spiritual uh, movements, obviously. Um, but he emphasized the, the unity of humanity, the oneness. And he was very, very, um, uh, he's well known for challenging hypocrisy and injustice wherever he saw it. And as such, he became effectively a bridge of compassion and undertook four great odysseys across Asia. And he visited holy sites relate, relevant to the Muslim world. He went up to Mecca, Saudi Arabia, as well as Benares and Jagannath Puri and so on, and to spread his universal message of oneness. And this really um, is the key to, you know, that original quote we we're looking at. We've got the, the message is the orchard and the thorny trees that, the Sikhs were trying to hedge around this orchard were the warriors, the Sikh warriors and the Sikh warrior tradition. Uh, what's fascinating about this painting, I love this painting, it's in the Thur collection, Devinda's uh, got, you know, Devinda Thur has got a fantastic collection of paintings and this stands out. It shows Guru Nanak debating with um, Ganpat yogis, you know, the split ear yogis, uh, on, the, pa on you know, the, the, the path of renunciation, you know, what is the true path? But what the artist has done rather intriguingly is he's given Guru Nanak a, um, a rather mixed um, appearance, the apparel and the, the accoutrements, the things that he's got, you know, the, the, the beads and the seli topi and so on, the janu. He's mixed it up so people can't tell if he's a Hindu or a Muslim. And, but sometimes Guru Nanak would dress like a Muslim to mix and to, you know, to lower everyone's barriers. He'd dress like, he basically dressed like the group he was addressing and he used the, the idioms and, and metaphors and the language of the people he was talking to to get across this message of oneness. Okay, I mean, if we could switch to the next slide, please. So the warrior tradition among the Sikhs originates, we'd say, uh, you know, in the change in relationship between the Sikhs and the Mughal Empire. And there's an incredible parallel that runs throughout Sikh history. And in many ways, if the Mughal Empire wasn't there, you know, would the Sikh, you know, would the Sikhs have turned out as they did? It would be completely different. It's a massive what if question, but you know, there's such an integral relationship, emperor to emperor, guru to guru, from a certain point onwards. It's quite remarkable when you sort of lay out the whole story. It, it stands out incredibly. So, during the times of Guru Arjun, who was the fifth Guru Nanak, you know, Nanak five, uh, in the six, early 1600s, that's when we see the beginnings of the this warrior tradition uh, emerge. Now, Guru Arjun is seen here, you know, he's a great organizer, he's seen here under the, the, the tent, 
and he's a great organizer and we see him here overseeing the building of the Harmandir Sahib which is later on under Mahajan Jee Singh became the Golden Temple of Amritsar and that was completed in 1601 a few years later he completes this incredibly grand project of compiling the writings of the Sikh Gurus and other mystics from Hindu and Muslim traditions uh, in, in the Ard Granth in 1604, which coincidentally is the same year that the King's James, King James Bible project kicks off. Um, so there's a, a fascinating parallel there. Now, Guru Arjan, two years after that, in 1606, was tortured to death under the orders of Emperor Jahangir for political and doctrinal reasons. And that really is the spark that kicks off this uh, warrior culture. Now, I should just point out that if you look um, next to the Guru, on the floor to the left, the two elderly gentlemen in white turbans, white beards. Um, the, one, the, the one nearest to us with the green shawl, is, we think is by Buddha, who was a Sikh of the times of Guru Nanak, and he had the uh, honor of initiating or, or overseeing the ceremony to initiate or to um, um, you know, do the coronation of each Sikh Guru after Guru Nanak up to Guru Hargobind, the sixth Guru. Uh, and he traditionally is seen as having taught uh, Guru Arjan's son the principles of war. And Guru Arjan put his son, his only son, Hargobind, under the, the wing of Bhai Buddha because he was a Sikh of Guru Nanak's time who had all this fascinating and deep knowledge. Um, that would be useful for the forthcoming mission. The chap next to Bhai Buddha with the red kamarband is Bhai Gurdas, and he was a scholar who's also an uncle of Guru Arjan. And it was his quote that we, we started with, to protect an orchard, hedge it with thorny trees. Um, and that underpins this warrior saint spirit. Uh, but what's interesting is Bhai Gurdas in his writings also talks about the uneasiness of Sikhs at the time. You know, it was a very peaceful movement. You know, there's Girtan and Seva, that was the mainstay of Sikh tradition. And then all of a sudden you've got this guru, there's, a, there's, a, there's this tragedy of a, mar a martyred guru um, and the Sikhs are now wondering what direction is everything gonna go in? And Bhai Gurdas writes about those sensitivities and he's saying the Sikhs don't understand what the sixth guru is up to, right? Um, because he's, he's beginning this warrior tradition, he's starting to train, he's, he's attracting uh, mercenaries from the Mughal army and you know, Rajputs and Muslims, all sorts of people are coming along, slightly unsavory characters, you know, with, with dodgy backgrounds. But they have, they, they, you know, under the Guru's auspices, they, they're there to serve a purpose. Um, and what begins as a standing army to initially protect the Sikhs against external aggression, would later on become a people's army under Guru Hargobind's grandson. How many of you could do the next slide, please? So here we have uh, a wonderful early, early portrait, which we think is contemporary of Guru Hargobind, the sixth Sikh Guru. Um, and it was he who established this standing army headquartered at the Agal Tagat, or the throne of the Immortal One, which stands opposite the Harmandir Sahib that his father built. And his army, because it was headquartered there at the Agal Dakat, or what was originally known as Dakat Agal Bunga, he has an army of Agalis, or immortals. And it's interesting, when he came to the Gaddi, or the, 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 the cushion throne of the, the Guruship, there weren't, you know, there was a period in which he was imprisoned, you know, for a certain amount of time by Jahangir and the Fort Gwalia. But when he was released, they spent almost 20 years training before their initial battles with the Mughal Empire took place. So they were small skirmishes, not large scale battles, but they were serious encounters and the Sikhs came out victorious in all of them. Um, and what's fascinating, his own sons, including Guru Tegh Bahadur, who would later become the Ninth Guru, were all brought up in that military tradition. So he's kind of established not just the spiritual aspect, but this, this military sort of uh, um, martial endeavor that must, must be there. You know, the, 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 the thorny trees must always protect this orchard. 
Now, Guru Hargobind's uh, grandson, the next guru after him, his eldest son, predeceased in Baba Gurudatta, then his eldest son, uh, Harai, or sorry, his second son, Harai, Guru Harai, becomes the uh, successor. And he is also trained in this military tradition, but he's told by his grandfather to maintain the peace as much as possible. But then Dara Shukko, who's um, a Mughal prince, the young, uh, older brother of Aurangzeb, um, you know, uh, son of Shah Jahan, uh, he seeks in the succession battle, Guru Harai's aid and assistance. And historic, historical sources talk about the Guru offering uh, yeah, military support to Dara Shukko, but Dara Shukko loses heart and um, it, it, you know, the Guru detaches himself from, from that particular mission. And we know that Guru Deg Bahadur's son, De, uh, sorry, Guru Hargobind's son, Deg Bahadur, who becomes the ninth Guru, he stood up against the forced conversion of Kashmiri Brahmins and he was executed for doing so under the orders of Emperor Aurangzeb. Um, for refusing, refusing to convert to Islam and performing miracles to prove he's a saint. Now, just before we move on, it's just important to say that this painting, you know, this, this is such an early work of art, very likely contemporary. It's almost as if we've got a painting of Jesus Christ in front of us, you know, for a Christian to see, you know, uh, that sort of portraiture, that time frame. It's an authentic image, and you can see how powerfully built the Guru is got the hawk and got the guard dagger and you know it's, it's a wonderful regal regal portrait very powerfully um built guru a very very um it's a brilliant portrait it's one of those things that i find absolutely mesmerizing exquisite detail and we discovered it by chance because it's actually miscount uh, catalogued as something else and uh it's in the seattle asian art museum if you ever get a chance to see it in person it's it's absolutely delightful to see um, just a very quick aside, I've got family connections to Sikh history in the sense of some of my ancestors appear in the history books, and one of them was a Sikh of Guru Hargobind. Uh, my ancestor, Fatuhi Rai, um, did service of Guru Hargobind when he came to our, our village, and there was this whole story, an incident about a hawk. The Guru loved hawks, and Fatuhi Rai had a hawk that was a gift from Jahangir, and uh, when the Guru sort of gave the hint that, you know, that's a nice hawk, i.e. you should present it to the Guru, um, Fatuhi Rai kind of got a bit scared, worrying what the emperor would do if he never, if he didn't, was called to the emperor's court and didn't have the hawk, the gift of the emperor, present. So uh, an incident took place. The hawk uh, basically choked on its thong, and um, and the wife, uh, Fatuhi Rai's wife, Fatuhi Rai's wife, chides him and says, "You idiot! You should have given the hawk to the guru." And look what's happened. He's kind of, you know, we've been cursed. And Fatuhi Rai rather. Uh, shamedly takes the hawk to the guru and the guru basically massages the hawk and has such great knowledge of how to look after these creatures that the, the thong was coughed up by the hawk and it came back to life or well, it never died but he kind of resuscitated it and my ancestor walked away you know with his with his ego suitably dented Amin, next slide please so the, we had this catalyst for setting the Sikhs on a path of kingship by Guru Teg Bahadur's son, Guru Gobind Singh, or Guru Gobind Rai, before 1699, when the castle was established and all you know, the, the warriors took on the surname Singh. And the 10th Guru established an army now of Nahangs. Now this is interesting because you've got the Akalis at the beginning and they become veterans of a small army. Now the Guru Gobind Singh's thinking, look, in order for us to uh, establish the Sikh tradition, make sure it's not overrun, overpowered, and we're not wiped out from the face of the earth. We need recruits and we need treasury. We need money to come in and supply us. Then we basically set in motion um, this mission of kingship for the Sikhs uh, that would continue after he had passed, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd left this world. So he opened the, the ranks up and he decided to create an army of Nahangs. Now he was a, a fantastic uh, Persian scholar and the word Nahang or Nahang in Persian translates as many things, but the main um, definition is it's, a, it's like a crocodile or a water shark. But in Persian literature, such as the Shah Nameh, it comes up time and again as a metaphor for warriors of unstoppable courage, male or female. So the Guru used this to say, I'm gonna create this army of Nihangs. Um, and in the, the mindset of the Mughals who were, you know, 
the Shahnameh and other Persian classics were read at the Mughal court, it would have a, a ring. They would know, oh my God, we're coming up against these, these, these incredibly dangerous warriors. So the, the structure then became, the warriors were known as Nahang's full-time warriors, and the leaders amongst them, the most um, trusted and the ones who'd served the guru previously were, were known as the Akalis. So you have Akali Nihangs and Nihangs. And the Guru did prophesy the, the, that Sikhs would establish kingdoms and one day sit on the throne of Delhi. So the Sikhs basically were told to rise up to the challenge. And in this scene, you've got, there's a wonderful painting by an artist, I didn't put the name down, but it's, it's a Muslim artist named Bashrat Allah. Uh, he did a series of these, and I think his son as well, Sheikh Muhammad, they, they, they complete a series of scenes from Sikh history for, we think, the rule of Nabba in the late 19th century. And this particular scene, you can see the Sikhs on the left taking on the Mughals on the right. Um, but what's fascinating is you see a chap in the middle, your Sikh, who's been decapitated. Um, and he's picking up his head from his gas almost. And that relates back to uh, a particular mindset um, and something that appears in Guru Gurmit Singh's writings in the, one of the, his reworking of the story of Krishna, Krishna of Dad, there's a character called Karak Singh. And you can look into the, 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 the book for more on this, but basically Karak Singh has his head chopped off by Krishna in battle. And he's a warrior of unstoppable courage. And he's so ferocious and his, his spirit has got such indomitable spirit that he refuses to be defeated. And he, as his head is, lopped off and starts to fall before it hits the ground he grabs hold of the his uncut hair and he continues to fight with his head taken off and that obviously becomes something of um part of Sikh literature and law in terms of the story of Baba Deep Singh and so on much later um and I've even heard Nahangs you know say this that you know you can you can chop my head off but I'll I'll, I'll, I'll continue fighting and I'll kill you with my head you know I'll beat you to death with my decapitated head so there's something very much in Sikh tradition that continued, you know, psychological warfare. They, they had that going for them. I mean, if you could do the next slide, please. So, so Guru Gobind Singh has set the Sikhs off on this path of kingship. Um, and the first attempt at gaining kingship was successful, uh, but it was relatively short-lived. And it happened under, you know, the, the, the leadership of Banda Bahadur. Uh, but sadly, you know, this is the, the Mughal, yeah, Guru Gobind Singh sent Banda up to Punjab to take, basically, crash the Mughal power and take a vengeance for the, 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 the brutal killing of his two youngest sons in Sirhan. Um, but that uprising was crushed um, and the Sikhs were then persecuted with a vengeance. And for several decades in the early 18th century, these are arguably the darkest period in Sikh history where they, they basically had a price on their heads, men, women, children. Um, and that drove Sikhs to the brink of extinction several times. Now this painting shows the battle in which Vazir Khan, the Subedar or the governor of Sirhand, where this brutal execution took place of the, the, the youngest sons of Guru Bhuma Singh. He's, he's killed in battle. Uh, you can see his headless body on the horse and on the ground, you can see his decapitated head and the blood flowing, it's rather gruesome. But what's interesting is this painting was done within a couple of generations of that event, we think. And it's really interesting to see the, the, the dress of the Sikhs at that time. You know, the, the chain armor and the turban style and, and so on is rather, rather unusual. Um, another connection, family, personal connection comes at this point. Uh, two of my ancestors, my father's uh, daddy, his maternal grandmother, she was from a village called Singanda Slodi, there are two Slodi villages, and one was the, a Sikh one, Sikh village, Singanda Slodi, and another one was mainly populated by Muslims. And there are two brothers who were in the, the service of the Wazir Khan of, uh, of Sirhan, who later joined Bah uh, Banda Bahadur. One of them was Ali Singh, and the other one was Mali Singh. So we've got that history, and, and what's interesting is after Banda was captured in 1760 and taken to Delhi and publicly executed, tortured and executed, he had with him 700 Sikhs, and each, each day of the week, a hundred Sikhs were beheaded. And in the last batch, um, I think Ali Singh was amongst those in the last batch. So we, you know, the, the Sikh connections to Sikh history come from several sides of the family. Okay, next slide please, Aaron. 
Okay, so the story continues. Now, the Mughal Empire is shaken in, in 1738, brutally shaken by a Persian invasion by Nader Shah, and then repeated Afghan invasions by Amr Shah Durrani um, for the subsequent two decades. So this gives Sikhs a chance to rally, and they adopted really effective guerrilla, guerrilla warfare tactics, not just to survive, but to flourish. Um, it was in this period that the Harmandir Sahib and Gartak could be destroyed twice. So there was a real attempt by the Afghans to demoralize the Sikhs and to sort of annihilate them. Um, but they, they were very speedily restored by the Sikhs to show that, you know, we're not going to be, we're not going to be broken. And this is the key thing that comes through in Sikh spirit that you can kill us, but you can't beat us. Eventually the Sikhs win and they succeed in establishing independent Sikh kingdoms. And to the extent that they even occupied Delhi for one day to fulfill the Guru's prophecy. But in true Sikh fashion, as many of us will know, they started fighting as to who, which Sikh leaders should sit on the throne at Delhi. Um, and their sword were brandished and then everything had to be calmed down. And they, they, they had to go back to Punjab and, and reconcile um, uh, and, and kind of never went back to take Delhi again. But they had fulfilled the Guru's prophecy. So that is something, I suppose. But then with the, with, after that, with the Afghans defeated, you've got independent, the arrival or the, the emergence of independent Sikh kingdoms. So all of these sort of independent uh, Sikh leaders of the missiles, there are 11 missiles, and then there's a state of Diyala, which was kind of subservient to the Afghans, but yet helped the Sikhs out when it suited them. Uh, they all established packets of territory in which they would have, um, uh, they ruled. Um, but once the, the Afghan threat disappeared because the Sikhs became, they, they came together to take on the Afghans. But once that threat dissipated, they just started fighting amongst themselves, right? Uh, so, so that really characterized that late 18th century period. And that's the period when, you know, the British are sitting over in Calcutta, uh, in Bengal, and they're watching what's happening in the Northwest a frontier region in the Punjab because everyone's going for Delhi. You know, the Marathas are coming up from the south, the British from the east, and the Sikhs are thinking, well, we can take Delhi any time. Uh, this painting is, is absolutely, uh, it, it's a stunner when you see it. It's, a, it's in really bad shape. I've cropped it in quite close, but it's kind of falling apart at the edges, and we almost weren't allowed to publish it because the curator was a bit worried. Uh, at the, the, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts that, you know, she'd get in trouble for not having looked after this painting. But this is how it came to them. And it shows two groups of Sikhs uh, come together for a conference to decide on how to defeat another group of Sikhs. <laughs> um, and the, the identities of um, some of the people remained hidden until we, we found, luckily, a, a drawing inscribed with names in reverse of three of the characters in, on the right-hand side. One of them, uh, if you can see him, I don't know if you can highlight him, I'm on the right-hand side with the bow and the shawl uh, in the middle, the long beard, black beard. He's Maha Singh, Ranjit Singh's father, who leads the smallest of the Sikh missiles, the Sukhajapi missile. And opposite him, the elderly gentleman with his hand raised, white turban and the, the plaid quilt, blue kashara. That's just a Singh Ram Gariya. And they've come together to take on the Ghanaian missile. And this is the famous incident soon after this, where the, the Jas in Ghanaian's son is killed in battle. And then a matrimonial alliance is made where, where um, Jas Singh's daughter-in-law, Sadakor, quickly um, arranges um, a matrimonial alliance with Maha Singh's son, you know, Madhapur and Ranjit Singh, um, are then betrothed at the age of five and three, I think. And then History is made by bringing those two uh, missiles together and, and the combined resources that were so critical to Ranjit Singh's later success. I've got my young son trying to join us. Aaron, can we go to the next um, uh, slide, please? Do you say hello to everyone quickly. Say hello. Hi. Thanks. Well, your mum wants to talk to you. <laughs> okay, so. Um, Ma Singh's son, Ranjit Singh, now we all know who he is and we can recognize him in this incredibly beautiful hilt, um, chiseled um, and overlaid with gold. He's the chap on the elephant who's sitting there. It's a really remarkable hilt because you just don't see them of this uh, exquisite quality 
uh, these days. Now, he was obviously somebody who changed the course of history. Uh, hugely ambitious, in one eye seek king, and he quickly assimilated the resources of all the other missiles. He had the backing of his mother-in-law initially, he had the backing of you know, various Sikh spiritual personalities, we'll come on to that later. And with that, he was able to basically earn the respect of the other Sikh Sardars, and he became a leader. And he didn't, as some people might say, he didn't, um, uh, he, he, he was a conqueror of the other Sikh missiles. He didn't consolidate sort of them on equal terms, but he conquered them. But they were allowed to live their lives out with a pension in some uh, territory, but they'd have to give service in exchange. But basically, Ranjit Singh was great and greedy, but in equal measure. So he's a really fantastic character to study. Um, a lot of myths surrounded, uh, surrounding him, obviously, but he's, he, he, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's got a bit of everything, really. Um, and he's, he's hugely ambitious. Uh, and he's there when the British are defeating the Maraktas, and he's got this really important decision to make. Does he support the Maraktas who are fleeing the battlefield and take on the British, or does he bide his time? And he decides to bide his time, signs a treaty of friendship, thinks I'm not ready, I've got too many other fronts I've got to fight on. So he, he basically says, look, I'll make Sat the river Satluj the lowest most of the five rivers of Punjab as my boundary. Um, but that with the British East India Company that was coming up north, you know, they, they had their, their northernmost um, headquarters at Ludhiana. And that left him free to conquer everything up to the northwest frontier beyond the river Indus towards Afghanistan. So he had lots on his plate to get on with. And he employed ex-Napoleonic commanders, as we know, um, and, and other mercenaries like Alexander Gardner that Amin touched upon. Uh, and they helped him modernize his uh, parts of his army on modern you know, European lines, basically. Latest technology, artillery, casting, and so on and so forth. And by the time of his death in 1839, his empire extended from the Khyber Pass to the borders of Tibet and included the rich provinces of Kashmir and Multan. Now this sword, um, I think it's reputed to have belonged to Ranjit Singh. There may be a case for that, but the imagery is brilliant because of, you know, it shows the craftsmanship at the time. Um, but other aspects of the, the, it's not just on this side of the hill, you turn it around and look at all the edges. There's something to please the eye in every part of this hill. There's hunting scenes, there's sadhus, there's animals, you know, tigers jumping on deers and so on. It's a it's rather, rather incredible um, canvas. Um, but also equally, um, in fact, in some, some ways more interesting is the inscription on the inside of the knuckle guard, which is in Gurmukhi script, and it's a quote on the nature of kingship, and it comes from the Krishna of Dar story, the, the Guru Gurma Singh's retelling of Krishna, the life of Krishna. And it highlights the deg and deg. Deg is the cauldron, which symbolizes uh, um, feeding the poor. Deg is the sword there to symbolize the protection of the poor. So in, in the eyes of Guru Gomis Singh, when he set his Sikhs off on this path of kingship, he was giving them the, the ideal, the standard by which they would be measured as kings, which is you feed the poor, you protect the poor. And the famous third part of the slogan, Deg, Deg, Fateh, Fateh, I would read as you're winning. I, you're, you're succeeding in your task as being a king because if you stop protecting the poor feeding the poor they'll leave you and your kingdom will will basically disappear you haven't got the support of the people just as a quick aside Deg Deg Fateh isn't originally Sikh it, it appears in earlier texts um, the, the rules of Malay Kotla are quoted as using a similar phrase so that's another aspect interesting aspect of Sikh history is that you unearth these Sort of, you know, the origin stories sometimes aren't what you think they are. These slogans that are very important to Sikhs. I mean, next slide, please. Let's race on. I don't want to run out of time. Um, okay, so Ranjit Singh, when he closed the Khyber Pass, he basically he was taking the battles to the Afghans with the help of the Nams. Uh, and these are the traditional warriors who were revered by the masses. They had sort of a priestly status with them as well. You, couldn't, you didn't really want to spill the blood of Nahang. Um, uh, and they're custodians, they're deemed to be the original Sikhs, the custodians of Guru Gobind Singh's traditions. And they were commanded by the, the remarkable character of Akali Fulla Singh, who, uh, Nihang, who was completely independent of Ranjit Singh. He was, I think, about 20 years older than him. And he, you know, he was thoroughly uncontrollable. Ranjit Singh just had to, you know, 
on military parades, the Nahangs would hop and skip by, you know, the British would be there watching this fantastic parade, all you know, Ranjit Singh's infantry, Europeanized army march past, and at the end would be these straggling Nahangs. And they would basically hurl insults at Ranjit Singh, at his guests, and say things like, we're gonna come and, you know, take Calcutta and build a bridge to London and conquer London. This is in front of the governor general, right? And whenever they, the Nahangs would hop and skip by and hurl insults, Ranjit Singh's bodyguard would just come in a bit closer around him to protect him because there, are, you know, sometimes another Nahang would come out of the crowd and try and kill him. Um, and, uh, you know, it was known to happen. So they were just a bit wary of the Nahangs, but they, they, they were such fantastic fighters that they, he would always send them up to the, the frontier regions to take on the Afghans, the, the implacable foes. Um, Gali Fullah Singh's last battle took place in 1823 at Noshera, and he was age 63. Um, and, he, you know, he goes into battle first on foot, fighting single-handed, gets a bit wounded. Then he goes back into the fray on horseback. Then his horse is injured. Then he goes back on elephant, you know, and he's injured. He's, he's kind of still fighting, but he goes on, on uh, into the, the, the hornet's nest, as it were, of these aggressive host of Pakan tribesmen. Who, who know who he is, and they all swarm around his elephant, and basically he's um, killed in that battle. And there's a fantastic poem we reproduce, a translation of a poem, near contemporary, we think. Um, and it's guaranteed to make your limbs quiver with the spirit of war, if you read that. Now, this, this um, close-up crop of a war painting, we believe, depicts a gully full of singing in another battle on elephant. Um, and we think it's like the only image of its kind. It's, you know, we haven't seen many others, uh, I don't think. And it gives a true flavor of that, the intensity of warfare back then. If you look at the shower of arrows coming towards him and you know, he's, he's not got much protection. Um, and it's that whole reckless courage of the Nahangs and they did so much to protect seek borders. And if we could switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. And here's a wonderful close-up study of a Nahang from that period. Arm to the teeth with traditional weaponry, uh, you know, the old stuff, alongside very modern wolf uh, um, weaponry, very modern technology. So there's something for every range, if you like. Um, but in many ways, you know, the lady on the horse in front, who's possibly his wife, possibly pregnant, uh, she is more significant a figure in this particular piece of artwork. And Warrior Saints contains a handful of examples of the bravery of Sikh women. Um, uh, and sadly, their story is hidden so deep, it's very difficult to, to unearth uh, their, their experiences in the archives, but we're hoping to do much more in the area, this area um, in future projects. You know, the, the search goes on. And we encourage everyone to you know, keep looking for stories of women, Sikh women from the past. Next slide, please, Amin. Okay, so Ranjit Singh's died in 1839. And then we've got this period almost, um, how long is that? five years, five, six years of civil war at you know, the court of Lahore, but also, you know, in the area surrounding that, you know, the, the armies are taking sides and so on. And it, well, the Sikh army becomes independent uh, of this very weakened state. And it's encouraged by the Nahangs to take control of the whole of the subcontinent. You know, the Nahangs, Nahangs are really pushing from the sidelines to say, look, you know, We've got to take the British. The British are doing things on the other side of the river subsidies. They're preparing for war. We've got to take the battle to them. And uh, alongside other, other aspects of the story, yeah, the, the Sikhs eventually enter into war with the East India, the force of the East India Company in the winter of 1845. And the, you know, three major battles ensued uh, to such an extent. On the night of the 21st of December, 1845, the British were within hours of an unconditional surrender uh, on the field of Feroz Shah. They ran out of ammunition, they were lacking reinforcements. But the, the, those forces were only saved, you know, the East Indian Company forces were only saved by the treachery of the Sikh generals, which was attested to by the commander in chief, Sir Hugh Goff, who later wrote about that treachery. And this, this image here is, you know, typical of the sort of the nature of the warfare. It's got really, you know, hand to hand, you know, Sikhs were being bayoneted and then lopping off the head of the, the, the British soldiers while the bayonet was impelled in the stomach. But what you see here is uh, there's a rushing of the Sikh camp at Feroz Shah. And it's probably drawn and painted by a participant, someone who was there and saw it happen. And what's really fascinating about this particular piece of artwork are the two 
three figures on the ground. You see the naked figures? They're pegged down. And we don't know if they're British figures who are, you know, being tortured, whether they're within being, you know, Sikhs were running glances through them or whether they're there to stop a rush, an assault on the, the Sikh camp. No one quite knows. We have to do more research now. Uh, next slide, please, Alan. Now, one of the incredible pieces of hidden history that we connect to this part, period of history, especially to the 21st, uh, that battle on the 21st, that night, uh, was something we published for the first time, Amr and I, in, in Warrior Saints. And it's the fate of Maharaja Karam Singh of Patiala, who we see here in all his finery uh, many years earlier. Now, he was a loyal vassal of the, the East India Company. His father signed a treaty in 1809. Uh, lots of Sikhs below the river Satyaj were scared of Ranjit Singh, and they all went to the British court at Delhi uh, for protection. So they had a deal where they had recognized the British as uh, the paramount power. And then when the time came to serve, to provide military supplies, they would furnish those troops and supplies to the British. Now, the sad fact here was that Karam Singh, uh, he was caught communicating with the Sikhs of Lahore during the First Anglo-Sikh War. And according to newspaper, numerous newspaper reports at the time, he was actually hanged by the British for treachery. Uh, on the 22nd of December, 1845, the day after. And, you know, this incredible act of brutality has remained a part of the hidden history of the anglo sikh relations for 150 years. And to such an extent that even the Maharaja Gyal, the current incumbent, um, Captain Amrinder Singh, he didn't like the fact that we had presented that story. He thought it was untrue. But what's incredible is that contemporary, contemporaneous reports at the time were saying otherwise. It was being reported in Britain, in the press. Uh, next slide, please, Emma. So after that first Anglo-Sikh war was over, the British allow um, the Sikhs to maintain a reduced state to survive. They sell off Kashmir and it's part of the deal to Gulab Singh, who's one of the traitors in this whole story. But then in 1848, there's a local rebellion in Mathan, as we know, and you know that's allowed to fester by the British over the summer months. And that results in what is known as the second Anglo-Sikh war. But you know, it, it didn't have, it wasn't, it, yeah, the Sikhs were basically at the court, the Leap Singh was a ward of the British Empire. Um, so this was happening under the watch of the British and it wasn't the Leap Singh, the, the, the boy king who was at fault here, uh, or his courtiers, funnily enough. But that you know, didn't get in the way of the annexation that took place. After three major battles, uh, you know, Sikhs sometimes gained the upper hand, sometimes with the East India Company. But in the end, the Sikhs laid down their arms in March 1849 near Royal Quindy. And that was the day, as one soldier said, that Ranjit Singh has died. Um, very poignant statement. And then Punjab, or the, the, the Sikh territories of, of Ranjit Singh that he had so carefully um, built, that was her, all annexed to territories of British India. Kona was then presented to Queen Victoria. The boy king, the Leap Singh, was forcibly exiled out of Punjab. Um, and then he would later on become a Christian and then settle in England, as we know. And basically, in Punjab itself, all the Sikh leadership was removed from the country and sent off to various places, such as Banaras or Allahabad, and kept under house watch for prison. And that was the end of the independent Sikh nation. And here we see um, a rather remarkable photograph, possibly, I mean, earlier than the portraits of uh, the Sikhs um, captured by Makosh. I think that was in November 1849. Um, uh, captured cannons taken by Alfred Hewish, Hewish who may be Asia's first war photographer. Um, so it's a rather beautiful uh, photograph and piece of history. Um, in the next shot, or slide rather, sorry. Now here we have one of the Makosh photographs. Uh, this is a prisoner. It's titled Sikh Priest. Uh, and we did a bit of digging. Um, and we think this is Bikram Singh Beddi, who was one of the key leaders of the war. Vikram Singh Bedi, he surrendered. He was at Rod Bindi when the Sikhs laid down their arms, and he was a descendant of Guru Nanak via the Guru's youngest, uh, younger of the two sons, Lakhmi Jung. Um, we've identified this as Bikram Singh based on references to contemporary sketches and paintings at the time. So here you have the earliest portrait of a descendant of Guru Nanak. And if we look at the next slide, Amin, also reproduced is a painting of Vikram Singh's father, Saib Singh Beddi, 
who's in the yellow on sitting on the couch. Um, and Saib Singh, oh, sorry, the chap in front of him, the black beard, red shawl, is uh, Saib Singh's eldest son, Deg Singh, who's Bikram Singh's older brother. Uh, Saib Singh Bedi, well, he was a towering figure in the history of the Sikh Empire, um, end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, and he was instrumental, absolutely instrumental in the rise of Ranjit Singh, so much so that when Maha Singh, Ranjit Singh's father, died, there's a story that comes down to us that at the, the funeral, Saib Singh was sitting on his couch, much like he is in this painting, and Ranjit Singh's mother, um, realized that the other Sardars, the other Sikh chiefs were plotting to kill Ranjit Singh because they thought this 10 year old boy, he's going to be as dangerous to us as his father was. So let's just get rid of him and get him off the scene. You know, he's a pest. Let's finish him before he becomes, you know, too dangerous to handle. And so Ranjit Singh's mother quickly shoved the young boy under the cot of Saib Singh. And Saib Singh then takes Ranjit Singh under his wing and says, this, this boy will become your leader one day and you must all you know, respect him accordingly. And so he was kind of like a protected figure. He was a, he was a made, made man in those days. Now, uh, in terms of personal connection, another um, aspect of my own family history uh, is that Saib Singh um, camped uh, in, in right next to our village when he was fighting against an Irish adventurer called George Thomas, who was rather fondly remembered as the Raja of Tipperary. Uh, who'd set up his own little principality not far from Delhi and had designs on, you know, taking, taking on the Sikhs and conquering Punjab for, for the British Empire. And Saib Singh took his army of Nahangs, who he had with him in constant sort of readiness uh, uh, to fight uh, George Thomas, and he camped at our uh, village to do so. And, and it's interesting that around that time, I think it's the 1790s, is when in our family tree you start to see my ancestors, the name start to appear as Singh. So that could have been that they were taking or being initiated into the Khalsa through Saib Singh Bedi. Okay, last couple of slides and then we're done. I hope I haven't overrun or bored anyone to death. Um, ah, now, this chap is somebody we affectionately refer to as Mad Eyes. He's on the cover of the book. Um, I remember coming across this this incredible mes mesmerizing photograph. I think it's one of the most mesmer mesmerizing portraits ever taken any time in the history of photography. Um, it was, he, he, he graces our cover because he's such an important figure. But when I first encountered him, I was on the hunt for clues about the Nahangs in this early warrior tradition. And I was at Hounslow Library revising, I don't know if it was about A-levels or something else, but I, I got bored and I went over to a stack of books on a shelf and I picked up a small book by Frederick Wilkinson on uh, antique swords. And as I was flicking through, you know, all these German swords and other European swords and a few Indian swords, there's a tiny reproduction of this photograph. And I remember I literally stopped and my jaw hit the ground and I was frozen in this sort of state of ecstasy and amazement that the, this image could exist. I went home, eventually when I, you know, pulled myself together, I went home and I tried to track down Fred Wilkinson. In those days, you could call up, you could call up director inquiries and I managed to get his phone number. I spoke to him and he says, oh, I think, I think I saw that in a Sotheby's photograph catalog. So what did I do? I went down to Sotheby's in London and I said, look, show me all of your catalogs of photographic sales going back 20 years, please. And I sat there, this very young, uh, young assistant, you know, very kindly helped me, you know, with a big stack of catalogs. And I just sat there for hours and hours going through each and every single one of them until eventually I found the, the, the photograph that Fred had sourced. And it was brilliant. It was like, you know, full of portrait and the chat sent an image. And then since then, we've been trying to find out more about who this character is. And, you know, we've made small inroads into, you know, that endeavor. But what's um, fascinating was the, you know, the, the story of the Nahangs, you know, this original warrior tradition in Punjab itself, it, didn't, it survived at the very margins of society. Where it flourished far better was down south in Hyderabad, in the Deccan, because the, the, the Sikhs weren't enticed 
uh, in the same way as they were under British rule. Under British rule, they were disarmed. The leadership was basically, the, the Sikh body was decapitated. All the leadership was taken off the scene. So the British rulers at the time had the, the raw manpower of you know, the, the Sikh peasantry and so on to recruit into their ranks. But they didn't want any leadership quality amongst them to raise uh, the banner of a third Anglo-Sikh war. Third Anglo-Sikh war. But down south in Hyderabad, they lived in a, the Sikhs there lived almost in constant danger because they're surrounded by Muslim populaces. And there's all those issues with the local Arabs and mercenaries who also worked for the Nizam. There's constant infighting. So the Sikhs kind of kept the pristine warrior tradition up because it was completely relevant to them in that particular context. Um, and this is where the story of volume one breaks off. And then we get into volume two, which talks more about Sikhs under the British, uh, fighting under the British banner. But just one more, I want to say, tell you, tell everyone one more story. Go back, Ham. I mean, you've got to go back. Sorry, I haven't finished. You've almost given it away. I want to tell you the story of um, another story that is kind of a bit ESP-ish um, between Ammon and I. Um, I remember Ammon went to New York in the early 19, or late 1990s, I think it was, to, for various things, but he went to, to the Alkazi collection a uh, fantastic collection of photographs uh, made by Ibrahim al -Khazi, and they had an office in New York. And Amina told me, emailed me saying, look, I'm gonna go to the al -Khazi collection tomorrow to look at their photographs, the Sikh photographs. It might be something, um, you know, could be anything there, right? And that night I had a dream um, about what Mad Eyes looked like. Cause this, this photograph, you gotta remember, is only from the waist up. And I had a dream where I imagined what he looked like from the waist down, if, if that doesn't sound uh, too bad. But um, the very next day, Ammon sent me an email. He says, Palm, I found a picture. You need to see it. And he, the attachment was the next slide. Ammon, it showed Mad Eyes, our friend, second from the left standing, full length. So we got to see the dream came true, basically. Um, Ammon had found the full-length portrait of Mad Eyes and his friends, which is, is an incredible discovery um, and a fitting one to end this talk. Thank you very much. Palm, thank you so much. You um, tour de force performance. Oh, don't say that. I'll remind you what you said over the weekend. I'll talk for about 15 minutes, then we'll go to questions, he said, Ammon. Talk for about 15 minutes. No, that was brilliant. Really, really good. Look, normally I cut this thing off at 6.30. I'm not going to do it today. It's the last one. Let's keep this thing going. There are um, lots and lots of questions. Let's, so if you've got a question, put your hand up. Um, you all know the score, put your hand up and I can ask you to uh, speak. Um, but there are a lot of questions that came up while you were talking as well. So let me just find those palm um, All right, let me go to the first. So you, you spoke about women. V Walker asked the question. Uh, you spoke about women women in the warrior tradition, and V asking the question, were there any Nihang women? I remember when we did the first book, we said, we don't want to try to marginalize the female story and just kind of crowbar it in. But back then we didn't really know too much. Since then, a lot of materials come to, to light. And as you said, in the, the newer edition, there's, there's some extraordinary stories in there. Um, but this is a very specific question. Are there any Nihang women? And I guess what V means is women who, uh, part of the Nahung tradition. Part of that Nahung tradition, as opposed to wives of Nahung. Yeah. Well, yeah, there are. We know that. You know, there, there are Nahung women or women of the Nahung tradition today, and they were there back then. And in the book, if I'm not mistaken, we've reproduced a, a rather beautiful painting by Emily Eden, who visited Punjab, uh, uh, Lahore, in 1838. She also then went to Patiala in 1839. And it was there, probably, I'm not sure if it's Lahore, Patiala, but she, she paints this um, family group. Yes. Of a Nahang chappy, a Nahang boy, and it looks like a Nahang on a horse, like a it's pony. Beardless. Yeah, like a teenager. Like, yeah, like a, yeah, but, you know, beardless, but with this, the, the turban, and, but wearing pajamas, not a gashada, not the breeches, which are typically just finished below, above, above the knees. And the, the, Tradition has it that that's probably a Nahang woman, an Agalan, 
a female gully. And we had a quote that accompanies that photograph of a missionary in Ludhiana, I think, who was visited by a group of Agalis, uh, Gali Nahangs, and one of them was a woman, female, who was the widow of uh, this, this Agali warrior, and she'd been traveling all over India with this group, his, with, his, with his jatha, his, the group of, that was connected to her husband, and uh, this missionary describes her and what she was wearing, and you know, the, the tiger claws and the coits, and she was one of, he, I think he said she was one of the most dangerous and looking women he'd ever met. <laughs> And uh, do you want to talk about what you're doing next year with, in, in respect of that kind of source material? Oh, well, oh, there's one more slide. Oh dear, I didn't do the last, last slide. Um, quick, where's the last slide? I've done it, I've done it, it's up. Oh, it's up, it's up, sorry. Oh my God. Well, in terms of what's coming up next, we've got two immediate fabulous uh, titles. One is the reprint in paperback. It's a very affordable 999 even cheaper on Amazon probably right now, is uh, V. Walker's incredible and beautifully written um, novel about uh, a grandfather and grandmother in World War One with lots of Sikh characters um, peppered throughout. And there's actually one new chapter. So if you've got the original first edition, you're not going to go, you, you know, you do well to get this reprint because it's got additional material. Um, so that's out November the 19th, but it's available on Amazon now. It'll be available on Kashi House next week. Um, and the book on the right by the wonderful Eleanor Nesbitt. I uh, hope she's in today. Um, that's, uh, that's a remarkable tome. It's gonna, it, it covers two centuries of Western women uh, and their encounters with Sikhs, both in India and abroad, um, in their writings and artwork. So it's a phenomenal amount of material that's been collated over the years. It's you know, been many years in the making. And I think over 250 illustrations, some astounding material, absolutely brilliant. And Ellen has done a fantastic job analyzing it. It's incredible, really. And that's coming out February 2021. And finally, just so you know, we've got a book on if any Australians in the house, uh, Anzac Seed coming out in um, April 2021 about the Sikh experience in Australia. Oh, thank you very much. And I guess Emily even features in Eleanor's. Emily and her sister Fanny. Lots mm. of her for, uh, paintings okay. sketch haven't been uh, reproduced before. Professor Dave Singh, who we know well, Professor Dave asked the question, taking you back to um, Alexander Gardner, and I know you know the answer to this one. What's the backstory of the tartan that Alexander Gardner is wearing on the front jacket of that book? Oh, no, I think, I think it's Nihal Singh he's talking about on Warrior Saints, isn't he? The tartan oh. that Sadad is wearing on the front cover. Yeah. Okay. That, that's, a, that's a military uh, tradition. They would wear, you know, tartan, over turban, or, or, you know, to, to mark out their, their ranks, basically. And their, he, their regiment. He's from the 45th Sixth, which were founded by a Scotsman, Thomas Rattray. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was probably borrowing from the Rattray tartan itself, although Possibly. those things were not tartans as such, were they? They were like cummerbands, if you like, with sort of long vertical stripes rather than cross hatches. Oh, I thought he was talking about Alexander Gardner's tartan. Do you want to talk about Alexander Gardner's tartan? Well, famously, Alexander Gardner was first photographed in 1864 wearing this incredible outfit head to toe uh, in, you know, fashion from tartan, but native cut. So he's got his turban, his jacket and trousers in this incredible sort of plaid, plaid centric style. And uh, the, the story is that it comes from the 79th Highlanders. But when you look at the plaid of the 79th Highlanders, it's uh, their tartan, it, it's not that. And it's something else. And what we were lucky to discover was um, Devinda, Devinda Thur, Thur collection, he acquired the, the, the brilliant, you know, almost larger than life-size uh, study that, is, that graces the front cover of the tartan turban. So we can see the coloring of one of Alexander Gardner's tartans. Um, and the mystery is still there. We don't know exactly the, you know, what the origins are of that tartan. So you know, if anyone wants to take that up, by all means. Yeah. Okay, so here's another one for you, Palmjit, um, because we tackled this, or you tackled this question really well in the uh, Empire of the Six work that we did. And it's asked by Pritpal Singh Khalsa. Um, and it, uh, uh, the question is, is it correct to say that Six never fought a battle to gain wealth or land? Uh, or for dominance over others. And how do you frame that context in, in the context of the saint warrior? So this is this notion that a warrior saint or a um, yeah, warrior saint has to be saintly. 
um, which often gets related to peacefulness um, or righteousness, should I say? Sorry, not peacefulness, righteousness. Yeah, yeah. Um, and how does that how does that equate when you've got characters like Ranjit Singh who were much more complicated than that? Well, this is an ideal, and you know, lots of ideals have been established in Sikh tradition, and Sikhs don't always maintain ideals, sadly. Um, uh, and and they, you know, Sikhs, you know, Ranjit Singh was what was he third generation king. Uh, second generation was his father's time. They were all fighting amongst themselves. They were killing each other, left, right, and centre, weren't they? Um, but the first generation and those who, the antecedents, the ones who are sort of surviving and, and really trying to, uh, you know, keep the Sikh spirit alive under incredible persecution, they, they did it out of a sense of shared brotherhood, shared sense of, you know, we've got to keep this mission going. Whereas afterwards, the ones who, there was a split, if you like, the, some of the missiles and the missile leaders, they settled. So some of these Nahangs and others, they basically settled and became they went from itinerant rulers to sedentary rulers and they occupied the mehels and palaces of, of the people they'd, you know, uh, beaten in, in Punjab, they'd, you know, the Afghan garrisons and the Rajput rulers who were the directors and so on. So they, they became rather more courtly and then they had to do matrimonial alliances with all sorts of people. They had to look after this wealth. They had to, you know, you know there was a whole job of kingship of that nature. But the, for the Sikhs, the original notion of what it meant to be kings was you, you didn't have to rule land. It was like, they didn't look at land itself as being the boundary. They kind of ignored that, the Nahangs in particular. They were trying to do dig, dig, dig and trying to uphold the higher standards. But do you, and do you want to comment on the notion of Rajaniti and the righteousness of that in, in the context of Sikhs? Well, the, the funny thing was in Sikh tradition, they knew the missile structures are such that if you did not look after the people you were ruling over, they could very easily jump ship and go under the, the banner of another Sardar. So it was incumbent upon you. It was like people who tried to set on new villages. I come from one village, the original founding village was Gujarwal, and then somebody left that to create Narangwal, right? And to, to then to set up a village, you've got to do some pretty nifty administration. You've got to look after people. You've got to make sure there's, there's an economy and you know all that sort of stuff. So under the missiles, it was an incredibly... Uh, dangerous time to be alive and for most most people in the populace if you could protect them from all the you know the the highwaymen and the invaders and and the wolves and all that sort of stuff then you would get their loyalty you'd get their taxes they would help you prosper so it was a very it was interconnected wasn't it so you had to have that sense of selflessness in a way but then you know things sometimes got in the way you, know, you have to spill blood. It's a very paradoxical lifestyle. All right. You have to, All right. For the Sikhs, the original Sikhs, is you spill blood, you take a life, you protect a life. And it's like only certain people can handle that sort of madness, I think. Yeah. Okay, much more prosaic question. Um, were there any images that didn't make it into the book that you'd like oh. to? And let me extend that a little bit. What's the, what's the, what is the image that you're looking for? What's the, what's the Holy Grail, Palm? The Holy Grail. One of the holy grails, not necessarily connected, but in a way, is Rani Jindkor, yeah. that photograph we made you know, reference to earlier. And but also, she was in London in the 18, whatever it was, 60s, 60s yeah, yeah, yeah. 70s. It's almost inconceivable that she it's conceivable she photographed. There, there must be a photograph of her. The, the other, who else are we looking for? Um, I, actually, the, let's put it the other way, Amon. The funny thing is this that I remember we did this one trip to the British Library where Rod, was it Rod, somebody, I can't remember his surname, the curator at the time, Rod Hamilton, something like that. This, this chap, never seen him again, but he was there when we visited and he printed off a whole list. They'd recently catalogued all their photographs and pulled out the Sikh list of the Oriental Indian Office collection. And he handed it to us and, he, and we looked at that and we looked at all these photographs. We had copies made and we, we came out of that saying, I think, I mean, don't you think, you know, we think we've found all the Nahung photographs and paintings and all that old ones we're going to find. They can't be more than this. And how wrong have we been? And in many ways, it's, it's, they present themselves. I'm always surprised as to what comes. I mean, especially working closely with the he is always on the hunt and look out. And he's finding incredible things all the time. There's more and more archives coming online in, in obscure collections where they're throwing up. I could show you things where you think, oh, my God, that's incredible. 
So sometimes, you know, you just want to be surprised. There's... Even with all of that, there's miscataloging, lazy, lazy cataloging, which just says, you know, Indian soldier or Indian types of Indian. And, it's... And, and there's some things that aren't catalogued, I mean, they're not catalogued and you have to sit there and look through a thousand images to find the one or find nothing. And I think also just, I, mean, I was looking at what we had collected during the 90s for, the, for when I was preparing this, and I thought, gosh, if I could have my time, and of course I can if I can make the time, but if we could go into the old Imperial War Museum archive like we did in the 90s, and I look through it through the eyes that we have now, I'm sure we'll find all kinds of other things. That back then, when it, we were picking the low-hanging fruit, we, we kind of set the bar really, really high. Um, and I think if we looked at it now, we'd probably find all kinds of other things. I mean, you tell a great story, um, sure, I'm ask you to repeat, but of how you and Davinda's brother actually find, find the image of the August Scherf painting of the Nihung being strangled, just about to be strangled. I, I didn't find it, he found it. Well, yeah, exactly, he found <laughs> it. You had been through, you had been through those catalogs. So. Yeah, I missed it, I missed it. And he's the one who's pointed out, brilliant. All right. Um, but I agree with you. I think the image of Ranjin Lithkod is a, is a really important one that feels like it's tantalizingly close, but... Um... Well, we found a photograph of Raja Lal Singh, one of the courtiers you know, at the court of Lahore, when he was either in exile in Agra or, or Dehradun. It's an incredible photograph. You know, it's uh, reproduced in Davinda's book, In Pursuit of Empire. Okay, I'm gonna just take a couple more questions and then I am gonna wrap it up because it's quite late. Um, do, 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 do. Let me get to the top. There's well, of course, our favorite images, but I think we've done that today. Uh, my final question to you, sorry, no, let's talk to Akashi House question. When is the second volume of, of Warrior Saints coming out, Palmji? And what does it take to get that, uh, to get that book into print? Uh, I think the, the most uh, apt phrase is Rabajanda. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know when these things come into print, only because it's, it's Primarily a, a financial question. We're a small organization, small resources, very small team. Um, these, the, the, the book is kind of almost ready. You know, when you're doing a book, you have, you have the material, then you put it into a file, right? It, a print ready file. And then you can get that bit ready, but then you need the, the cash, you know, tens of thousands of pounds to make the book, the physical thing. You got to market that, you got to sell it, and you got to recoup the money to put into the next project. So um, we'd love to do it, but it's just, it's just, um, it's a financial issue. And this goes back to seek publishing. It goes back to the whole notion of, you know, do we want to see a thriving seek publishing industry? And you know, Palm, the, what it, and maybe for everyone as well, actually, what it takes for that thriving publishing industry, is, it's really not that much. It takes one in a hundred British six, not even Canadian six or American six or Indian six, but just one in 100. 1% of British six to buy one of those books from Kashi House. Because if you oh, sold 2,400 books in that first publishing run, you know, the first couple of months, you'd be done, wouldn't you? Costs, costs are taken care of. And, and it just takes 1% of British six to do it. But we're finding that's quite a tough. If, if I could say, I mean, it's interesting. There's a model that we're operating now, but this isn't the, the model that you need to make it a sustainable, generationally happening thing you know we need to make this something that our children's grandchildren can prosper out of and enjoy and be a part of we need people to be putting their skills and talent you know like we've got so many people in law and it and you know in, in all sorts of corporations who are fantastic brains fantastic skills and mindsets but you need that in 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 this industry and seeks are missing a trick because they're not in media they don't understand it in the way they should the power that you get with it the influence the way you can shape and control the debate and the landscape and if I was to throw out a number, and it's a big number, and I'm not saying that we're here the, with the fundraising buckets today for this, but just so you, you, you get a sense of it, you, you, you need something in the order of half a million pounds a year for 10 years, five million smackaroonies, five million quid with a really great publishing team who can commission great works by great authors. And even then, at the end of that, you will not know whether or not you succeeded. There's no way of telling. And we've had this discussion in the past, right? Because it's all down to the, the market. It's all down to individual readers. There's a, there's a sea change in sorts of representation. Um, and whether, you know, BAME communities are, are, are there, do they exist? 
And we know there are some fantastically dedicated people, including those obviously who are listening today, but you need to multiply that by 10 for it to really set off and for there to be a future where, where we can keep on telling stories. And just last thing, we've got, I think one of the things that marks us out in a way it's very different from other publishers and storytellers is we've kind of almost inherited a way of telling the history of the Sikhs from early British writers. Yeah. They were writing political narratives about the movers and shakers in Sikh history. You know, what, who's got a military force there? Who's running that bit of land there? How are we going to conquer them? What's their weakness? This, that, and the other. Whereas the true history of the Sikhs, someone could argue, and I would, is that who, who are the people who kept Sikh tradition alive and passed down from, you know, the Guru's times through 18th and 19th centuries? Who are those people? How did, how did that story of the Sikhs, that's the story of the Sikhs I'm really interested in. Right. So that's it. Maybe, that's the final, maybe that's the final question then. Sarabjit asks it. Sarabjit's been a constant um, visitor to, to the book club every month. So it seems fitting that we end with the story from her. Are there any aspects of Sikh history and heritage that you would really like to further explore or to see others do? Everything. We, 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 need, a, we need a complete... I, I can't tell you how my, my brain explodes at these sorts of questions. For me personally, it's like I said, I want to, it's the, who's kept the traditions of the Sikhs alive? Who really were the, the Sikhs who have, were connected to Guru Gurmati and then passed that down? And how has it come to us? That was my original question when I started off in this quest in the late teens. But as a, from a publishing perspective, from a publishing the start on, then it's all, you know, we need fiction, we need nonfiction, we need this, we need that, we need memoirs, biographies, whatever, whatever, art books, you know, all sorts of stuff. We need everything. Super. Palm, I cannot top that. Thank you very much indeed. That was an extraordinary presentation. Um, I think we did leave the best to end by having best to the end by having you here. I want to thank everyone that's joined us tonight. Palmjit, you're going to come back for 2021 um, and talk to us about one of your other, one of your many other passions, I'm sure. Uh, thanks to everyone that was involved. Um, and see you all next year when we restart the 2021 series of uh, book clubs. Thank you.